Well, hi, everybody. My name is Diane Gilman. I am a cancer survivor. I was on QPC and HSN for 30 years and called the queen of genes. And I had stage three breast cancer, but I made lemonade out of lemons. Uncorking a Story presents Cancer is a Stupid Jerk, a podcast where we share real stories from fighters, survivors, caregivers, and healthcare heroes who stand face to face with cancer and say, not today. We're all about embracing the laughs amongst the tears, finding elements of joy and lessons along the way, and proving time and again that love, laughter, and community are important tools on the treatment journey. So, whether you're in the thick of the fight, cheering someone on, or just here to be inspired by incredible tales of courage, resilience, recovery, and the undeniable power of the human spirit, you're in the right place. Because together, we're showing cancer that had picked the wrong fight. Now here's your host, Mike Carlin. Well, hello and welcome to another powerful episode of Cancer is a Stupid Jerk. Although today's guest challenges that notion, and you're going to hear all about it. Today on the show, we have Diane Gilman, who was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 71, and she'll tell you that while life handed her lemons, some, some pretty serious lemons, she made some even more serious lemonade out of them. She went on to pivot from her extremely successful career in teleretail as TV's Jean Queen to finding a new purpose in life, helping women over 50 reach their potential and thrive in life. In our conversation, Diane outlines the many important lessons that cancer taught her. So let's jump right in and listen to Diane Gilman's story. Well, tell me a little bit about uh, a little bit more about your your cancer story, and maybe just start by painting a picture of what life was like before cancer came into it. So I've been in fashion for fifty years, and I invented a middle aged jean um, for women who had a body type like mine big around the middle, tiny little legs, and it was a huge sensation. I took that from HSN in America, Teleretail, went to QVC Europe, and was doing TV in Milan, Paris, London, Dusseldorf, Toronto, and Melbourne, uh, Australia. And uh, Florida. So I was crazed. At a certain point, my business partner passed away from brain cancer. Terrible. And I needed a partner. I needed a lot of resources. I just didn't have time to do for my business and myself because I was always traveling. Um, It was a very high stress lifestyle. It looked on the outside glamorous, um, paid extremely well, but every day was like drinking down gallons of poison. The people I went into uh, business with, sold my name to, were extremely difficult, extremely hostile. They wanted my business, but they didn't understand the philosophy behind it. And um, Christmas Eve of 2017, for about a year before that, I knew something was wrong in my left breast, but I kept telling myself, oh, come on, Diane, you're 71. Don't be ridiculous. This is just calcium deposits. I just didn't want to deal with it. Told myself, you're too busy. Oh, no, no, no. You've got to fly to Milan, Italy tomorrow. Da, 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 da. And then at some point, it got too hard to avoid. A friend of mine who was a doctor sent me to get a sonogram. And the news on Christmas Eve was, oh, your news is terrible. You've got cancer everywhere. Right breast, left breast. Da, 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 da. And I thought, oh, my God, it is Christmas Eve. Okay. So I call my friend, the doctor, back. He hooks me up with the head breast cancer surgeon from Mount Sinai Hospital, Dr. Alyssa Port. And she she's flying off to Morocco. He's sailing off to the Caribbean. And I'm stuck at home thinking about, oh, 
my God, what have I done to myself? I met her. She was exactly what I needed. She looked me up and down. She said, I know you from TV. She said, listen, you look like a perfectly healthy woman with a localized disease. And if it hasn't spread, you are 100% curable. And if it has spread, you are maintainable for years. Okay, good to go. (laughs) Then we did everything that needed to get done. I had to go into chemotherapy for about five months, the strongest chemotherapy. I then got radiation and I then got a double mastectomy. And in between the radiation and the double mastectomy after nine months straight Brutal treatment, but not so brutal for me, actually, but strong. I was back at work. I was on air again. Lost all my hair, came on air with, you know, maybe a quarter of an inch, looked like Annie Lennox. And in the meantime, I thought to myself, are you happy to be back? I was happy to be back to connect with my audience base because it was like a female community, but it wasn't actually that happy to be back. And I started to ask myself some very deep questions, which I think you do ask yourself when you are faced with your own mortality. And that was, do I want to do this for the rest of my life? Am I using all my talents and skills? Am I getting the kind of spiritual rewards from this that are going to help propel me to live a long life? And the answer was no, no, no. Now that was really illogical. Most people would say, oh my God, Diane, you were number one fashion personality on tele-retailing around the world. But I thought, you know what? It's time to take a new direction. I felt that the fact that I survived and was given a second chance was such a privilege that I couldn't let go of the idea in my mind that there must be some purpose for me here beyond selling my genes. And I think the purpose is teaching women over 50 how not to be ignored, how not to be forced into silence, how not to be shunted aside, how to reinvent themselves as I was having to reinvent myself after cancer and live that part of your life from 50 or 55 on happier and healthier. And um, so I quit. (laughs) I told them I'm leaving. I don't think anybody was too happy, but um, because my doctor, my, my surgeon had told me that my cancer, even though it was estrogen based, was so stress related, I knew that just switching to another diet, going vegetarian or pescatarian, doing more exercise, whatever it is I had to do, that was not getting to the root cause. So I thought to myself, as many of you may think to yourselves, if you're 55 or 60 and you're going to retire, what? skills have I developed and can take with me and translate and reinvent into a new life, a life that doesn't perhaps have direct links to the corporate world, which I think is brutal on people who are not well and also people who are aging. You just age out of that. And I thought, well, I can talk. I can talk in front of a camera Oh, and I have silver hair. Maybe I should be a silver-haired influencer and podcaster. And here's me, totally untechnical, no, absolutely nothing about the internet, except I really, really, really like TikTok, and I only shop online now. So um, I was retired for exactly four and a half weeks, and I was like knocking around the house and thinking, This is the biggest mistake of your life. And somebody got in touch with me and said, 
I didn't know you were free. I heard you say goodbye on HSN. I have a po developed podcast. I would love you to be the co-anchor. Oh, okay. So I thought this is a good way to understand the rhythm and the what you can talk about. So I did that, but then I felt sorry for the guy. It was his podcast, but he allowed me to pick the guests. I picked all female guests. They were all female issues. Poor guy. So people said to me, come on, you could do this yourself. And I thought, ooh, I've never. I've always had a host with me. But, well, okay, I'll try. And it opened up a whole new world to me where I had in 30 years on air and 50 years of fashion been surrounded by the same people forever. It felt like there was never anything new or expanding or inspiring or even aspirational. Suddenly I was out in a world. A lot of people knew me, which really surprised me. And you could be talking to life coaches, doctors, physical therapists, you name it, and fascinating. And I slowly but surely got more comfortable with being a host, and I really found my purpose. And And here's my purpose. So uh, last week I flew out to L.A. to do a live interview on CBS for the western half of the United States. And... I brought my books with me, two co-anchors, co female. In the commercial break, one says, oh, my God, Diane, I really need your help. My mother loves you. She loves your genes. She just turned 65. She retired. She feels horrible. She feels like life has no purpose. She doesn't know what to do with herself. She's so depressed. Then during the next break, the other anchor says, oh, my God, Diane. My mother just turned 65. She loves you. She feels she has no purpose. She retired. What's she going to do with the rest of her life? Came back, then did an interview for Fox Orlando, Florida. And she said, my mother just turned 65. So what I think my purpose is, because I want to use my time really wisely, is to teach women how to age modern and live longer and fuller lives. Because it's unbelievable, 51% of America is over 50, but no one gives us a roadmap for the later years. So the big mistake is you keep trying to live as if you were younger, where there's all kinds of role models and visuals, and but that doesn't work for you anymore. And also that image of having cancer. I know I had a lot of people I had to let go of in my life because they treated me as if I was going to die. And that was not the philosophy I was living by. The philosophy was cancer is a period in my life. Learn about it, use it, grow from it, be enriched by it and move on. Well, it seems like the cancer for you was, was a gift in the sense that it helped you shed some some very negative things, this negative environment yeah. you were working in, which, you know, may have you know, like in, encouraged the cancer to begin with. I mean, that's. That could oh, no, they the said, yeah, it. yeah, definitely. And then it, it subsequently helped you find purpose in life. And, you know, a new purpose, a new, yeah, a new purpose, not not yeah. your only purpose. But, yeah, um, you know, I'm curious, like the, the work that you're doing now how does it compare to the satisfaction you were getting when you were kind of coming up in in the industry and, and making a huge, you made a huge mark in, in the fashion industry? It um, took a long time. Remember, I was a late bloomer. So the idea of the middle-aged gene would shot my company up to $100 million a year uh, retail um, didn't come until I was 60. So I had a lot of years of being right below the surface of being famous, being very frustrated. Um, I think the hallmark of my career was I never said no. If they said, will you do a 4 a.m. show? Sure. Oh, somebody got sick. Will you fly down and do their hours for us? Sure. So when I broke free, I think, first of all, you can stay at the party too long. 
So the party of teleretail, when I joined in 1994, was just coming up. And then uh, about 10 years later, 2004, it really started to hit its peak. It was huge. The, the day I came back from uh, cancer treatment, was for a Thanksgiving Day show when you know everybody's home, the men are all watching football, the women are all bored, and they want so tell retail. Perfect. We sold two hundred and twenty-five thousand jeans in one day. That was the peak of tell retail. Now and and that said all time sales record. So it as cable started falling because there were so many other subscription kinds of TV coming in. So fell the sales and the viewership of teleretail. And um, I think it also had a customer base that was aging out and, and younger people just don't watch TV that way. So I felt okay about that, but from Understanding I could talk in front of a camera like this and I could speak about what I wanted to speak about. I had no idea how much of my base would follow me. And then um, you know, because I was a because I was an entrepreneur and an owner, the one thing that was super important to me was always with in terms of design to not have a ton of corporate layers watering down my designs. But to get them out there and have them have full impact because they all had a philosophy behind them. Um, there's a philosophy behind my podcast, now two podcasts. I do Too Young to Be Old, title of my second book, which coincidentally just happens to be right there. And then now we're doing also Fashion Thursdays with Diane because so many women know me for fashion. My time is used differently, but not so differently because actually the whole time for COVID, three years, we had to do our TV shows from home. We had to do them remote. We did them pretty much just like this. It was a, for, a, a format with Zoom. So I think the difference is I feel more freedom. I feel like I can say what I have to say and what I want to say. And I loved, absolutely loved fashion and being creative. Now, let's separate that. Loved being creative. When you do your own podcast, and, and you know this, Mike, you can be very creative. You're the boss. You choose the subject matter. You choose the guests. You choose the format, the timing, everything. and. Um, so interesting thing is through my new podcast, I joined a women's group that's international and then they're writing a book and I'm the first chapter. We each wrote a chapter. So it's a woman's anthology about trauma. I wrote about cancer, my experience. And then they said, we'll back you on your own book if you want to write your fourth attempt at being published yay and uh, possibly get into public speaking and ted talks and i thought yeah i think i would really like to do that so i think the thing that um is the most inspirational to me out of it all are the you know people tell you the stupid stuff and you think to yourself I, if I hear that one more time, I'm going to punch somebody like, oh, when you close one door, another opens. But it's actually true. And there's a reason why those sayings stick around forever. And my life is so much more interesting now, so much more active brain-wise. And, you know, I substituted fashion design with Life reinvention, reinventing my life to something better for me and more useful for everybody around me. And I'm doing the same thing I did in teleretailing, reaching out to women and trying to form a collective and a community. And we do talk frequently about cancer 
And because breast cancer is just unavoidable, one in every six, I think actually at this point, one in every five women is going to experience that in a lifetime. And um, I, I, I think that it's very healthy for me. And I think it, and hope that it can be incredibly useful for anybody who makes contact with me. So I'm very aware of my audience and constantly bringing up subject matter and guests that give them actionable purpose in their life. It's very important that whoever I have or whatever I'm talking about on my podcast is someone doing something that we can all benefit from. Do you think you would have made this change in your life, you know, pivoting from, you know, what you were doing to to what you're doing now, if, if cancer didn't come into it? I think eventually some disease would have come into it. You couldn't live the life I was living. You know, I made literally sometimes four round trips to Europe in a month, every month, every month. In between was Florida, where QVC was. It was always a lonely hotel room. It was always a long plane ride. It was always crummy food. It was always people telling me, oh, you didn't make your numbers, or yeah, you did, but it wasn't good enough. Or, um I think eventually I would have gotten some disease like hypertension or something that would have made me step back. But would I, I I think I might have gone on for a little longer, but um, the company that I was, that I had sold my name to, they had a philosophy It was so weird. I mean, they bought the company because a designer came up with a concept that was just nobody else had it. And there was all these millions of women out there that wanted it, that didn't even know they wanted it or didn't even know it was possible for it to exist. But they, they were, there was always a lot of strife and fighting because, in fact, where I had an average age 55, to 60 year old customer they wanted a 30 year old customer so it was always a constant battle to change everything i think cancer uh does not necessarily motivate you to do what i did you could also take the attitude with cancer uh i'm weak i'm damaged i'm less than nobody else will ever hire me this i've got to keep this job forever So I think there's a lot of different ways you can go. And um, my way was just, it was a miracle to me that I came out whole and I came out feeling healthy. And I just thought to myself, wow, life is really precious. You don't want to waste or underline misuse a minute of it and so i think taking it from um that viewpoint uh, which is a, a really almost a spiritual viewpoint i made the right decision i think um when you have cancer there's so many things in your life that you may suddenly see that you obviously have to change. There were people that wanted to help me. There were people that had been in my life who treated me like I had a communicable disease they were going to catch and couldn't get to the door fast enough. Um, There were people that were very obviously sure I was going to die and they were just tolerating me saying I'm going to be well soon. And uh, there were people that believed I was going to be. And so I think if you have cancer, you have to totally just catalog every part of your life and take out the negative parts, take out the people that are not going to be able to deal with your trauma, no matter at what level. And um, it was a total refresh 
for me. Yeah. And and uh and um it was amazing. Once I was even though I was number one for years at Tell Retail, once I was out of it, I sort of became this iconic septuagenarian legend and gotten so much praise since then and so much respect and quite frankly some really good opportunities that I would have to say I could have never predicted that in a million years but I just chose the light over the darkness and here's what the light offered and um I also <laughs> pardon me never allowed myself one second of saying oh my god oh my god oh my god you're not going to make it you're going to not make it you're going to die you're going to die you're going to die everything was i'm going to do it i'm going to be the best patient they ever had which i was not and uh, <laughs> and this is going to become one segment of a long life and and just one thing that will tell you how my brain works but it was a good thing when i found out that i was going to have to be in treatment including um radiation for let's say 8 months straight i calculated how many days i had been alive and then i calculated how many days of treatment i was going to have and i said look diane see that you've been alive for like 100,000 days and you're going to go into treatment for 200 days that's not so bad right i just kept tricking my brain into not being depressed and i also told myself <laughs> you could turn around and be diagnosed with diabetes crohn's disease ms a million diseases that are chronic and you will never get over and progress with cancer there truly could be an initial beginning a middle of treatment and a potential end and so i thought that was a pretty good deal I mean, your mindset was was just right. I mean, you mindset is everything. I mean, I think mindset is as important as the the treatments that you're going. I think so too. I think my my mindset was, and I I think that I have, and I've learned. I'm learning this from doing these podcasts and uh, writing about my experience with cancer for Women Thrive anthology book, which will be out on Amazon June twentieth. and that was i have a basic and essential need to succeed at anything i do so i took cancer treatment in stride as a challenge and i was going to work with it and i was going to succeed at it and um i learned so much along the way I it, some of the lessons from cancer were absolutely invaluable and I think it changed me into a more sympathetic, a more human, a more empathetic person with a purpose and goals that can be my legacy. So you know, I I think it's very different um getting cancer at the age of 72 than it is at the age of 22 or 32 so i really don't worry about it much and i think to myself that i'm just so grateful constantly to be alive and constantly want to do something good with it i want to do something with purpose that is going to help others and i can't say that about many of my fellow fashion files you know fashion is such um a completely selfish ego driven youth obsessed industry as is fashion and uh so from that point of view being outside of it is a good thing too and if i if i if i miss fashion 
I just go shopping and buy a new pair of shoes and I feel really good about it. <laughs> there's there's that retail therapy everyone talks yeah, about. Yeah, totally, but, totally. You know, just as as we wrap up here, I love the fact that you you kind of characterize and then continuing with the book analogy, um, cancer is one chapter in in a very long book, a very short chapter in a long book, but not the final chapter. And, um, you know, I think when you are an only child like me and you've worked your whole life, and you get to a point in your career, which I was in, I mean, I, I love the fact that I was in fashion for 50 years and then in, in, on TV and tele-retail for 30. And it was my call to walk away. Um, you get totally isolated and you start believing your own publicity, which is the worst thing in the world you can do. And, uh, you know, I'll I'll tell you a very quick story, and it is the essence of how cancer changed me. So I went to, coincidentally, a beautiful breast cancer clinic. That's all they did. Dropped into Mount Sinai, um, and it was gorgeous. There were fresh white orchids everywhere and beautiful plush leather furniture. You had your own chemo room. You had your own masseuse giving you a massage while you were getting chemo. You had your own lunch. Me, Sorry. You had your own catered organic lunch. You had your own TV. You had all these advantages. And so one day, I'm in the chemo room. I'm about three quarters of the way through my chemo treatment course. And I hear, oh, oh my God, I love to see her. She was here. So point, I'm at the height of my career. People are asking me for my autograph. I step out of my front door. People rush up to me. Oh, Diane, I love you. I felt great. I loved that stuff. I loved all the attention. Um, Hey, everybody, Sheila's here. All the nurses go running into next door to me, Sheila's room. But I really cannot see her. And they're screaming like, oh, Sheila, you really look great. Oh, it's so good that you're here. And guess what? We saved you four lunches. And I'm thinking, nobody even asked me if I wanted lunch. So I'm thinking to myself, and this is how my brain worked at that time. Is this Sheila? She must be a Broadway star or a female anchor on one of the news networks or a soap opera star or something. A nurse comes in. I said, why didn't you ask me if I wanted lunch? And she said, because you never eat lunch, Diane. And I said, well, but it would be nice if you asked me. She said, okay, Diane, do you want lunch? And I said, well, no, thank you. But I do want to know who is Sheila? And I'm thinking glamorous, wealthy, famous. Because how come they were all doing this? And I said, oh, I not only want to know who Sheila is, how come she gets four lunches? And the answer is, and this changed my life. Sheila is a battered wife who cannot go home. It's too dangerous. And she's living with her two children in a homeless shelter. And she has stage three cancer. The food is so horrendous in the shelter that our lunches give her a full meal every day for four days. Otherwise, she would literally starve. And I thought, oh, my God, there before the grace of God, go I. And I suddenly understood that a big part of my lesson with cancer was that I was just part of a very intricate weaving of what society is and, and what women are and what they go through. It humbled me. It absolutely shook me to my core. And it gave me a much broader picture of 
what was going on in the world, but what I had to be thankful for. Because a lot of people go through cancer and it's like, cancer sucks and I hate it and I hate my life. And uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I got to go home and have a real meal. But Sheila didn't. And then when Princess Kate came out in a pair of jeans, which really meant a lot to me, and talked about having cancer, I thought, princess, from princess to pauper, we are all the same. Cancer is the great leveler. And so um, I hopefully became a much more humble, much more empathetic woman who knew that her purpose was to give back for a life of glamour and money and style and prestige and to help others. Yeah, well, that's a, a, a great point to end on. That's a beautiful story about Sheila. And I'll be sure to put a link to the new anthology in to our show notes. Uh, because Yeah, we'll get that to you. Yeah, that would that would be great because this will come out uh, after that book launches. So perfect. Well, I thank you so much for having me. And, um, you know, it isn't easy to talk about it, but um, I think people have to know if you get that diagnosis, it is not a death sentence. It's just a bump in the road of life. Thank you for joining us today on Cancer is a Stupid Jerk. We hope you found inspiration in today's episode and felt the strength of a community that refuses to let cancer have the last word. Remember, you're not alone in this fight, and every step forward is a victory. Join us every Sunday for more stories of resilience and recovery, and make sure to subscribe to our podcast on YouTube or your preferred podcasting platform. If you want to follow us on social media, you can find us at Stupid Jerk Cancer. If today's story moved you, consider sharing it with a friend or somebody who might need a dose of inspiration and encouragement. For all you bibliophiles out there, please check out our sister podcast, Uncorking a Story, which features interviews with best-selling authors. Until next time, keep laughing, keep loving, and keep fighting. This is Mike Carlin reminding you that together, we're unstoppable.